All right, today we got Elliot from Marine Collectors, and we're going to talk about the 10 things that he's learned about ozone. And I happened to learn a couple of things along the way right with him, uh, and something that we've been discussing. So I can't wait to uh, share this one. Starting with number one in relation to ozone, it's incredibly effective. Yeah. At well, <laughs> everything. <laughs> uh, clear water, uh, all of the like secondary aspects to it. I mean, it's uh, normally used for like sanitation and sterilizing stuff, but uh, in the reef tank, oh my God, like we put it on your tank and got rid of diatoms in 12 hours, oh. like gone. Uh, uh, and dinos actually. Oh really? Yeah. Hmm, fantastic, check that out. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's just, uh, it's one of those things where you always hear about it being used, particularly in commercial operations and like almost all wholesalers use it and like public aquariums and uh, it's always been one of those things of just, I was afraid to use it because of the hazard and like health risk to it. Um, also the health risk to the tank if it ever got overdosed. But yeah, I tried it out for the past year or so. And I don't think I'd ever do another large tank without it. It's, so, uh, it's pretty incredible. <laughs> my experience was uh, first with ozone was uh, way back when Live Aquaria opened for the first time, right? Mm -hmm. They allowed you to go come out there and tour it. Mm -hmm. And so out in Wisconsin, I drove up to Rhinelander because I'm that nerd. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I wanted to tour the facility and all of the skimmers, man, have mm -hmm. uh, ozone units on it. And I would later see that in commercial facilities all over the place. They, they just run ozone on this stuff. Yeah. I attempted it in my own house and my own like wannabe little farm. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> the reality was is I didn't really know what it was doing or not doing. And then I just never did it again yeah. until recently, like almost 20 years later. Right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I did it based on feedback from you, but these are some of the things that you could probably expect from it. You might actually affect it, uh, some of the health of the fish can improve. Mm -hmm. You actually definitely will see the water clarity improve and oh, stably. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you, in my case, the dinos and diatoms went away. Mm -hmm. uh, you might see a whole lot of things that are related to oxidants improve in the tank and you're gonna hear a whole bunch about them today. That was number one. And so the next of 10 things I learned about ozone was Use it to manage, mm -hmm. not treat. Yeah, so um, I think in most applications where it's normally intended, it's meant to sterilize, sanitize. They use it for uh, parasite management. Um, but in our case, you know, assuming that this is going on a healthy system, there's no need to sanitize the water or treat the parasites because maybe you would have done quarantine to begin with. Um, and my exposure to it was strictly because I just wanted clear water. You know, uh, the tank that I put it on is 10 by 6 footprint. And when you're looking down the long way, you can very clearly see when it turns yellow. Mm -hmm. uh, and we 10 put... feet of yellow <laughs> is really yellow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and like even if we were to do 100% water change on that tank, uh, you know, we feed four sheets that are this big of nori every day. Within a week, it's already, you know, stained the water. Um, and we put it on there. Uh, I started off at really low dosage, lowest dial on, um, what's the one that you guys Ozotec? sell? Yeah, the Ozotec Poseidon thing uh, with the dryer and it's run on a uh, RK2 skimmer. And I tell you by the morning it was like crystal clear, like we had changed out the entire water or just put like <laughs> five gallons of carbon on the tank. Um, and then I was like, okay, well, I only ran it for two hours, so I probably don't need that much of it. Um, and then. The idea is that we're just running it to keep the water clean and clear, not so much to treat anything. Um, and that as we were running it, I realized that the ORP was going up. It's like, okay, well, it's obviously oxidizing all this stuff because um, the ORP kind of gives you an idea of the oxidative potential in the water. Um, and to keep it within normal range and to not be with that risk, the way that it's being run now is just like a timer. You know, it comes on for an hour a day at night. Um, lowest setting and it's been like that for a year and it's just worked flawlessly. Okay, so we actually saw what you were talking about in my tank today. Now, mm -hmm. Cherry, I turned ozone on, I turned it off, I'm gonna turn it back on. I'll show you why uh, mm -hmm. throughout this video today. But uh, today you can see like there is some white coralline, you know, what mm -hmm. used to be coralline in the back and down the like length, yeah, the of, length of the peninsula, the mm -hmm. it is yellow, it should be white. 
But if we go to the sides of the tank and you're just looking through like a little bit of water, mm -hmm. it's this bluish white, mm -hmm. right? And it's because you're looking through like, I think if it's just like a little bit yellow, well, this is now twice as yellow, and this is now four times oh, yeah. as yellow, and eight times as yellow, mm -hmm. and 16 times more yellow. So, like, when you're looking through the length of it, it definitely has yeah. an effect. So, a peninsula is a big, big thing. But uh, for me, I got to tell you, like, the change here, I, I, you said use it to manage, not to treat, and yeah. I used it in the opposite way, right? <laughs> I, and I think the purpose of this is to, this is still one of those things where I wouldn't say that anybody really knows how to use this ozone perfectly. We're learning, so come along for the journey yeah. here. Well, so the way that I run it is more just managing risk, right? Uh, because ozone, it's really toxic stuff. Uh, you're not supposed to breathe it, and if you were to potentially overdose the tank, you could just sterilize the entire tank. So when you say really um, toxic, I gotta tell you, every time I went to Brookstone, <laughs> those ionic breezes coming out the front, mm -hmm. uh, they're air filters and it kind of smells like a rainstorm. Mm -hmm. That's ozone. Yep. So for like really, really toxic, man, like the environment in Brookstone mm -hmm. must have been terrible then. Uh, or a sharper image it was. Uh, uh, yeah, and so uh, I like, I don't know the level for sure that it's it's supposed to not be healthy, but like, are you gonna kick the bucket? Like, cause you yeah. smell some? No. Probably not. Um, I mean, we're in a particular, un a particularly unique situation just because it's in a warehouse, you know, and people aren't around breathing it all the time. It's also at night, uh, but it's just, if you're gonna run it, also run it with the intent that it can also kill the tank if it gets overdosed, mm -hmm. you know, which is why it's on a timer and it's not, um, so the way it's normally run is like you would peg it like you would with a calcium reactor. You would pick a level of ORP, like let's say it's plugged into your apex, and then it would dose ozone up until your ORP got to a certain range, turn it off. Uh, I personally don't like that just because let's just say the ORP is not an accurate read or the probe is off. You could potentially just kill the entire tank. So why not just use it for the absolute bare minimum of what we need it for, which for me was clear water, um, and then nothing else because Bare that's all you need yeah. okay so that is why i was actually doing the opposite not managing i was using it to treat and so uh after i had heard what you were talking about i was actually mm -hmm. looking for clear water right <laughs> uh, and so i decided to throw the ozone on there and you would also introduce me to an idea which was different which was mm -hmm. instead of pegging it to the 350 yeah. uh, and worrying ORP. about breathing this stuff orp mm -hmm. uh like what i could do is just turn it on for a couple hours a night in the middle mm -hmm. of the night when nobody's breathing the stuff anyway. Yep. Uh, and you know, it's in a skimmer, it's gonna turn over most of the water multiple times in mm -hmm. that period of time. Uh, and so I did that and I turned it on on Friday. I came back on Monday and diatoms and dinos are gone. You know how I know they were? Cause we took them in the microscope. <laughs> this, this tank had had this problem over and over and over mm -hmm. and over like it was just like you know it would it's bloom they stuff. would go away yeah. they bloom they go away mm -hmm. it's just like i never had a tank like this and have they been back no yeah. okay well yes actually what so I, I let it run that way for like i don't know maybe a week or two mm -hmm. and then it's like well i wonder what happened i turn it off i turn it off and it didn't come back with the same vengeance mm -hmm. it didn't come back on the rock at all it came hmm. back only a little bit, like that kind of brown dusting and stuff yeah, in the sand, the sand, you know, that's just annoys the mm -hmm. hell out of you, but <laughs> like isn't really causing a problem. Yeah. And then I turned it back on this time only for one hour a night. Mm -hmm. So, and, and also I moved it from the skimmer that it was on, which was the, like the main bubble king in there. There mm -hmm. was like also running this like CO2 uh, media and, and I just didn't want to monkey around with it. So actually what I got was a separate skimmer, which was just that like DOC uh, skimmer from Like Tunes. ozone reactor? Yep, the smallest mm -hmm. skimmer that I could find, you know, that fit in there is that DOC skimmer yeah. from Toots. And I plugged it into just that. Mm -hmm. And only that turned on one hour a night. All the brown crap in the sand, gone, man. Yeah. It's pristine all the time. And then I let that run for like a month. And then mm -hmm. eventually I turned that off and it never came back, man. It's, it's just awesome. the, the sand's clean all the mm -hmm. time. Okay. Absolutely incredible stuff. Yeah. So for me though, so you get into that toxic kind of conversation, mm -hmm. it's 
Well, I want to use as little uh, of anything that I could use to solve the problem that mm -hmm. I have. And now that when we were looking at the tank today, we were looking at how it's actually got a yeah. yellow tinge to it. And you can't really tell until you know what to look for. In yeah. this case, we know what to I look mean, for. Once you go with ozone, you'll never be able to go back. It's just not the same. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna go back to the hour and night on the slowest skimmer mm -hmm. that I could possibly have because it will process enough of it every night. Mm -hmm. And you might even be able to go as little as like 15 minutes as yeah. possible. Cause Honestly, yeah, recirculating through here. so the thing is, like, you and I both have relatively large systems. Uh, and I think that probably for the average person, maybe like an hour once a week is probably going to be fine. Uh, because whatever is occurring, it seems to last and you don't need a ton of it. It's incredibly potent stuff. And for some reason, whatever it oxidizes doesn't come back, at least not with the same like, uh, what's the word? Vengeance. Uh, yeah, yeah, vengeance. Yeah, yeah. it's just uh, uh, it's absolutely incredible. All right, that brings us to number three. A little ozone goes a long way. Yeah, so incredibly potent stuff. Uh, I mean, the tank that we started it on at the shop, it's 1,100 gallons. Uh, we started, like, if you look at the ozone Poseidon unit on the side, there's a little dial. Um, I think we started at, like, three. Uh, and then after a year, we've slowly tapered it off, and now it's sitting at one. Uh, when we originally started it, the tank was pretty dirty. The ORP was sitting at like 200. Um, after a couple months, it went to around three. And then we started to dial it back. And right now we're sitting at about 450 ORP, which is incredibly high. But we do have to actually replace the ORP probes pretty regularly just because they do fall out of calibration. Um, but the uh, Thing there is that you want to taper it off as the ORP is going up because at a certain point you will get to a little bit too much um, oxidation and you don't want to over oxidate what's in your tank. So ORP is basically a balance of the amount of oxidants and the amount of organics. So just to give you an idea, I'm just gonna make up a fictitious number here, <laughs> but if you had a thousand uh, organics in there and a thousand mm -hmm. oxidants, well, that would actually be basically the same ORP as 1 million uh, organics and 1 million oxidants, mm -hmm. right? And so ORP isn't actually telling you the amount of oxidants yeah, per se. It's, it's kind of like a ratio or potential. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of a murky area, but that's generally the idea. No. Okay, so here's the thing is like when you start this, you're gonna have a lot of organics. Mm -hmm. And so it's gonna take a lot of oxidants to eventually get there. Now, the knee-jerk way that an average Aquarius would go was like, well, more faster, more better, yeah. right? Which is never true. In fact, one of the Particularly best- Particularly not with this. Yeah, one of the best heard things I ever heard was uh, if it took you a year to cross this problem, man, be happy if it took you only a couple months to mm -hmm. get out of it. And it's probably better than even if you found an instant cure. Yeah. Because in this case, if I'm just dumping oxidants all of a sudden in to solve the you know yellow water and organics I've been building up in the tank for the last two or three years, mm -hmm. uh, probably not the best idea. Instead, what I can do is just add small amount of oxidants every day, and then over the course of a few yeah. weeks, build up to that and will slowly deplete. So having this like really, you know, kind of toxic event happening yeah. in the tank. Well, so I mean, uh, the distinction there should be that you're not ramping the orb or the amount of ozone you're dosing up, it's just naturally going to uh, occur that way. Mm -hmm. And as the ORP is going up, you should dial back the amount of ozone that you're doing. Um, me personally, I would just keep it on the lowest setting and use as little as possible. Um, because just to achieve, achieve clear water, it doesn't take much. I'm having the yeah. same experience as you, which is setting it on the Ozotech one on number one, mm -hmm. not number 10, and running just a couple hours a day is enough. Yeah. Uh, I, we have talked about the Ozotech ones a lot because they're like high quality. I think they're mm -hmm. made in the United States and you can replace the little Corona discharge easy. Yeah. But I'll be honest, man, like the cheap imported ones that cost one third the cost <laughs> uh, might even be a better solution because they suck more. Yeah. Uh, they don't produce as much. So. You could also use it without the dryer, which means that uh, if there's humidity in there, it'll actually produce less ozone too. It will bear, wear out the corona discharge yeah. faster, but it's luckily replaceable mm -hmm. in that case. So yeah, you can, uh, a little goes a long way. Uh, don't try to get anywhere super rapidly because uh, the oxidants will do a lot of really cool things in the tank, but there's always too much of a good thing. Yep. All right, number four, 
accurate ORP probes are crucial. I just heard you say that you wore these things out. I have not ever had that issue. So tell me about what that looks so, like. So uh, this was kind of one of those things where, uh, like I'm not a gear person at all, but I've come to realize that when you're using ozone and you're relying on your ORP probe, they actually have to be replaced pretty frequently just because they well, what fall is, out. What of, does pretty frequently mean to you? Uh, like at least once a year. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, we've been, or I, we just replaced the probes on our apexes for that system uh, that we were experimenting on it with. Uh, and the reason why is because, you know, I posted on my Facebook if um, anyone had ever had ORP after they took ozone offline, stay really high. And for some reason, like my ORP was like 480, you know, 500 is where you get to like sterilization. And uh, everyone's like, oh, it's got to be the probe. It's got to be the probe. I'm like, guys, it just, it's ramped up so slowly to that range. It wasn't like it just shot up immediately, like something, uh, you know, just uh, there was too much oxidation. And we took ozone off for like a month too, and it was still maintaining that height. Uh, turns out it was the probe because when we plugged it back in after not running ozone for a month, it was down in like 275, 300. Uh, and now the new probe's working and it's right there at the middle hole threes <laughs> so just for reference point orp is one of those things you should not calibrate even if you can mm -hmm. uh I, I mean i'm gonna butcher this but i believe one of the methods of calibrating is mixing like ph4 with quinhydrone which is a very difficult thing to get a hold of yeah uh, and then it will create whatever that you can calibrate out of that but like they have calibrate packets yeah they have a calibration fluid but, but the, like the I'd... systems aren't designed to yeah. that actual range what that calibration fluid is better to, better for is checking reasonable accuracy. Mm -hmm. So if you dip it in the thing and it gives you a reading that's somewhere around yeah. where uh, is on the bag, I mean, and 20 points ain't gonna make any difference one yeah. way or another. Uh, if it's somewhere around there, again, we're actually like talking about potential. <laughs> we're not talking about like a real measurement. Uh, it just has to be close to that. If it is, then basically that calibration pack is telling you okay, this is still good. Mm -hmm. If it isn't, it's just really time to replace the probe. Yeah. Uh, you could go ahead and violate that advice and you're more likely to mess things up than you are to make it better, especially when you add another probe in the future and you're gonna have to recalibrate mm -hmm. the whole system to that oh, yeah. one again. I got a second one, just secondary, just double check redundancy, just in case, because yep. uh, I'm paranoid about it. But <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know, almost anything like if, I mean, you have a lot of expensive fish in your facility. Yeah. Like so another probe is immaterial to the cost of the whole thing. Yeah. But like even at home, almost like if I want to do this for a year or two, who cares? Mm -hmm. Right. But if I want to do this in an environment where I want to have this tank up for 10 years or I want to have it up until I want to take it down, mm -hmm. I don't want to fail. Is a, And failure isn't one of the causes. It's because I move yeah. in, upgrade, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Uh in that case, almost anything worth monitoring is worth having a backup to monitor it. Yeah. Uh, if, if, if that isn't true, I probably didn't even need to monitor it in the first place. You know, uh, yeah. It's an interesting way to think about it. Uh, okay, so accurate ORP probes are crucial. Next one, uh, number five, best use on a skimmer with an independent feed pump. What does that mean? All right, so uh, again, this is totally anecdotal. Uh, but in, I think the reason why, like a lot of times you'll hear that uh, adding ozone will improve skimmer performance or completely collapse it. And I think it has to do with the ways that the skimmer is designed. Uh, like at my shop, the skimmer, it's an external skimmer. It's fed with a L1 Vectra or no, L2 Vectra. Um, and anytime the ozone comes on, it's like the thickest, driest, most dense skimmate foam ever. I mean, you could see full size PE mice shrimp getting sucked up into it and getting pulled out into the collection cup. Um, but on the flip side, when it collapses, I think it's just because there's too much ozone uh, occurring inside the reaction chamber, being the skimmer, that it's not actually allowing the bubbles to be created. So this is an important point. Uh, what he's getting at here is the skimmers that you have at home are different than the ones that are in commercial areas. Because mm -hmm. often commercial areas are like down drafts and they're like, they're not your like normal needle wheel type, yeah. you know, uh, the whisks air together. Mm -hmm. They're like shooting water really fast at something. It creates all this frothy foam. Mm -hmm. And so when you add the ozone in there, 
it's actually very little ozone to the amount of water inside this big, huge skimmer. Yeah. That water's going through it really fast. And what the ozone's doing is changing the polarity of some of the mm -hmm. contaminants in a way that they flock together and create a stable foam head so stable that it can even push a, you know, a, a mice's mice at the yeah. top. Yeah, oh yeah. Okay, at home though, in most of these systems, like a, uh, like a recirculating, or not recirculating, but a needle wheel model, there's actually really little flow actually going through mm -hmm. that skimmer as it's sucking in some water and yeah, whisking it with I think the air. ratio is significantly higher. In almost every case that I've used yeah. a uh, ozone unit on a skimmer in a home environment, totally collapses the uh, uh, foam head mm -hmm. to the point that the skimmer doesn't produce anything anymore. Yeah, I would love to hear your guys' feedback and the same thing and what your guys' experience yeah. is at home for the people that are using it. But Definitely that's uh, comment below if you use ozone because I'm going to follow the comments too. Me too. <laughs> uh, I, I want to know because this is a world that's been around for a long time. There's mm -hmm. some brave people, but this is still trailblazing. Yeah. There's still people out here figuring out how to use this. Uh, and I think that concept of you know is ozone safe in your house mm -hmm. is one of the biggest things for me and how to remove it uh but i'm kind of circumvented by by like using it at midnight for an hour yeah you know? well i mean even for the ones that i have at the shop because originally it was running during the day uh and the skimmer that we're using is designed for ozone like it has a dedicated ozone port um and the top of the skimmer cup actually has a port so that you can vent out the um I guess excess gas remotely. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. So top of the skimmer cups, plumbed, PVC line goes straight out the window. So one of the things that like uh, I did in the past is you could put carbon on the top of it. Mm -hmm. and the carbon will break down the ozone immediately. Yeah. But what I found is once the moist air is going over it enough and the carbon gets wet, the moist carbon mm -hmm. no longer functions. Okay. So I actually had that same problem in a recirculating uh, CO2 scrubber, mm -hmm. right? Where it all the media just got wet. Sure. But when I put one chamber that was only filled with like a foam pad. Uh, to absorb the moisture it, first. Yeah, it, it collected all the moisture mm -hmm. and dripped down. And then all of a sudden the media wasn't wet. So I'm wondering if the right solution for like mm -hmm. a home environment, if I want to remove the carbon is put a couple layers of like, I'm almost thinking, take your skimmer cup, set the thing up so it doesn't skim at all. That's not the purpose of this thing anymore. It's for yeah. ozone. And, you know, take out the neck and just put a couple layers of that, uh, like, a, you know, filter material like you'd find in like your BS reactor or mm -hmm. something uh, and a sheet. And then on top of that, put some carbon and the carbon will last near like probably outlast <laughs> your tank at that point uh it, it's just breaking down it's just serving as a reaction is that area. what you did for the co2 reactor you have on your tank yep, that's what okay. we did for the recirculator yeah, it totally yeah. worked it, the moisture problem went away immediately. Cool. so I'm, I'm curious if we design these things intentional but for me what i did is because i haven't had good luck with ozone in the skimmer if i still want the skimmer to skim mm -hmm. even though that's the opposite of what you might hear that's why i put it on part of the reason i put it on only that little yeah. tunes one and I set up the tunes to not skim anything. Its sole function is to whisk together the uh, ozone into the water. Did you happen to notice if your other skimmer was pulling out more? I did not. Mm. I know, I, I, but it would be hard because I, I wouldn't, it would have been at midnight. Yeah, it you know, I guess I'd have to be monitoring <laughs> it. Yeah, I did not notice that. Uh. Okay, the next one here is, uh, it will clear. I mean, this one, man, <laughs> uh, okay. Number six, will clear bacterial infections in fish. Okay, so we're gonna rephrase that a little bit just because it's not, uh, the way that it That's comes very off. Definitive. Yeah, the way that it comes off is a little bit uh, more certain and it's purely anecdotal, but uh, like when fish, and I'm not talking like parasitic infections like uranema, but strictly when fish have infections where you see little white tufts of, uh, like epithelial buildup on the body. Um, sometimes they'll be as small as almost look like ick, sometimes not. Um, actually, I'm pretty sure I have some photos that I sent you we can put on there. But uh, yeah, had some nasotangs, these like large white patches of just bacterial uh, growth on them that were in that tank. And they'd been like that for months. Within a week of putting ozone on there, just gone. 
like disappeared. You wouldn't even be able to tell. That sounds like my experience with the dinos and mm -hmm. diatoms. Like, boom, it's just gone. A problem in here, it's, just uh, gone. No, it's absolutely incredible. However, uh, I think it's the next one. Sorry, we're gonna jump to the next one because the flip side of it is I have noticed that fish's fins, if they're fighting, they don't Number heal seven. as fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Number seven, uh, it's true. They don't, uh, I, or I don't know if it's true or not, but you're saying they don't heal as yeah. fast. Uh, purely anecdotal, but like normally a healthy fish, if they have torn fins, it'll heal in a couple days. But I've noticed that, you know, I've got uh, probably 80 or 90 fish in that tank and they squabble, they fight. Sometimes they'll get torn fins. It usually takes about a week or two now. And it's like, huh, it's probably the ozone. I wonder why that's happening. You know, maybe it's just because like the fresh tissue that's regenerating is uh, being oxidized as it's growing just because it's so delicate. But uh, I definitely know it takes a little bit longer to heal. So this is for me, you know, like I know adding to the oxidants to the water is going to solve a bunch of problems for me now. Mm -hmm. right? it's, uh, the evidence for me is too compelling. Yeah. OK, but also. This is part of the reason I want to add in as little as humanly possible because mm -hmm. I do not know yeah. how much you can add before you have de detrimental mm -hmm. uh, effects on biology. Yeah. Like we know for sure if you put too much in, you could actually like kill everything in the whole thing. Oh, yeah. You could just like turn yep. the water to bleach almost. <laughs> uh, but we don't really know where that magical boundary layer is. And that's why using as little as possible to a specific goal. And why mm -hmm. ultimately when I solve my dinos and diatom problem, why I just turn the thing off. Yeah. Right. Now I'm thinking about turning it on as minimal. And like I was going to turn it on for an hour. But now yeah. even as we had the conversation, I might only turn it on for 10 minutes a day mm -hmm. and see how long you know it takes before the water's clear. And if 10 minutes a day is enough to actually do that, because- I think it would be enough. Yeah, because personally. you gotta think that there's only a little bit of yellow going in the water yeah. every day. And basically we'll pump 100, you know, like- uh, I mean- We'll pump probably 50 gallons through the thing in yeah. 10 minutes every single time we turn the thing on. The contrast between, I mean, like your tank and mine is that you're putting pinches of food in there. I'm putting pounds of food in there yep. every day. Um, and I think for the everyday hobbyists, you're gonna need so little to achieve that clear water look. It just, uh, you know, it doesn't need to be overdone. Just start really slow. I'm gonna say <laughs> the question that comes to mind is like, well, why would I put anything in there that I think might be harmful and would materialize mm -hmm. in a way that might hurt the, the gills, fins, or whatever? And I'm gonna tell you personally, the reason that I would have this dialogue with somebody as we try to figure out what's right for them is the worst possible thing for a tank is for it to look like crap and be overrun, right? That thing is a death sentence for everything in there, mm -hmm. right? Okay, but if the tank looks pristine and beautiful, uh, there's a high likelihood that the person caring for this is going to care for it more than if it looks like crap. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a mix in here that beautiful tanks are just well, are better cared for in most cases. They'll live longer and happier lives in, in those. Yeah. And then you cannot ignore that all of the, not all, but a lot of the commercial facilities out there that mm -hmm. you know, do this for profitability are using this as well. So uh, again, a little bit of the wild frontier here. Yeah. We're being trailblazers. You can come along for the ride or you can kind of wait to see how it pans out for everybody. Yeah. There is a mix of we haven't figured out how much is too much uh, mm -hmm. and how much is to solve my problem, start slow. You know what, I think that, especially if, when ozone's going on to an already healthy tank, it's just one of those things where it's like, it's gonna amplify the fact that the tank's already healthy um, just by you know maybe taking away some of those extra organics that are gonna get oxidized. Um, but like, I don't know, the more we talk about it, it's not as, um, detrimentally high risk is maybe we're making it sound no it's just we're giving it do all due respect yeah i mean yeah. like if you guys knew the type of fish that i care for you would know that i wouldn't do anything to jeopardize those fish and like i'm very comfortable saying like it's more beneficial than negative to have it on there many of the fish uh he collects by hand man like <laughs> uh talk about getting close to the source so these are mm -hmm. his pets in his house and he's taking care of them for him taking care of them that way. Uh, 
And then another one in here in that spirit, uh, uh, number eight, my experience being your experience, mm -hmm. uh, has been positive for lymph and viruses as well. Okay. So again, totally anecdotally, but, uh, I've seen it make it go away substantially quicker. Uh, or like there was a weird virus that had been going through that tank for the past couple of years where like occasionally we would have a fish that had been fine for years. It would start breathing really heavy and it would stop eating for a week and then it would kind of like be lethargic and then next week it would be fine. And I couldn't tell you what it was, but the only thing that it came to mind was that it must be a virus of some kind and all the fish are just kind of going through the motions like somebody was sick and you know unfortunately in at least in our hobby there's no treatment for viruses but uh since ozone's been on there i haven't seen any of those fish uh, have that same reoccurrence in behavior and i've probably added another 20 or so since then so it's, again totally anecdotally but the, you know it's anecdotal though that when we share these stories mm -hmm. and other people can say hey i had the same one and like here, here's where you start to see the truth in the matter is if a hundred people raise their hand and you know, 50 of them say, yeah, it's all that problem. 50 say, no, I don't. It's either not really this thing. It was something else mm -hmm. or it's something unique about the way that you were using it. We need to identify. But if 90% of the people say, yep, my anecdotal experience is mm -hmm. that it goes from anecdotal to plausible for me. Yeah. Right. Uh, but you got to kind of figure out that ratio in the room. Uh, and then we continue to you know, learn off of each other's experience. In fact, right now, I cannot wait until the next tank that I set up, if it has dinos and diatoms, because I want to use this tool mm -hmm. so bad to turn it on and say, oh my gosh, it goes away immediately. What comes to mind is like uh, uh, using, what's the, the, the pill for bryopsis? Uh, fluconazole, mm -hmm. right? And so people put fluconazole in the tank and we know it has like not like a zero impact in the tank. Yeah. I can tell that because the alkalinity uptake immediately drops. Like the corals don't necessarily like this, mm -hmm. but the tank was overrun with bryopsis and this, like nobody even has this problem anymore because like the solve the, the solutions mm -hmm. are so easy to solve now. But yeah. prior to that, man, once Barapsis got in the tank, it was taken over. It was such a hard thing to beat. It yeah. would just cover everything. Well, we put the fluconazole in, not perfect for every organism in the tank, but it's way better because that tank was about to come down. Yeah. You know, it was about to get overrun. So I can't wait for dinos and diatoms to show up. Maybe not perfect for everything in there. A tank in your house. Yes, mm -hmm. I can't wait. Uh, I'm sure we're going to set up some here too. <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, another one here is most people know this one, but they don't really appreciate it, which is it will clear the water. Ozone. It uh, will make the fish look like they are floating in air. Uh, there's no better way to describe it. It's, uh, you know, when you have a brand new batch of salt water, it's, bright or it's kind of like light blue in the bucket type of thing that's exactly what it recreates it takes all that pigmentation out and it's just uh, uh pure clear water <laughs> you, you know what comes to mind here is how much money people will spend to get low iron glass which is like you know just uh -huh. changes the tint of the green in mm -hmm. about you know three eighths to a half yeah, inch a of, of glass right uh-huh okay and it just like changes the tint just a little bit right mm -hmm. uh meanwhile we've got this yellow water in there that it, if you if you look dead on you might not notice if you look through the entire side of the tank and then look at anything white on the other side mm -hmm. of the tank you say oh my gosh it's so yellow mm -hmm. right uh what we always say is if you really want to know, suck out five gallons and put in a five gallon pail and then put fresh salt water in the other one. The salt, fresh salt water will be crystal clear blue. Mm -hmm. And this one's dingy yellow. You just had no idea. Yep. And the, the effect is so stark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and yet we spent a thousand bucks on fancy glass and no effort on this thing that's so much mm -hmm. more impactful. Also carbon too. I mean, think about uh, all the times you got to do the maintenance to change it out. I'm and not good at it. Yeah, I'm not good at changing it. I don't like carbon because in my experience, it only lasts like a couple of days and then the water goes yellow again right away. So the amount of food that you're putting <laughs> yeah. in, I agree yeah, wholeheartedly. Yeah. Uh, and so like for me, I 
just like I put it in. Mm -hmm. I prefer to actually use it in a bag these days over and put oh, it really? like in the baffles just uh, <laughs> over the reactor because I don't like monkeying around with the reactor. Yeah. Uh, and you know what? Like even then though, man, I just like, it's not top of mind for me. And so I just don't change it mm -hmm. all that frequently. I'd rather something that just maintains it stably all the time. Yep. That'd be a better solution for me. All right, uh, in relation to that, <laughs> it's just that very one. It's uh. more cost effective than carbon. <laughs> in a lot of cases, it is. Uh -huh. You know, a bucket of ROX carbon sounds like 40 some bucks, right? Uh, and, okay. you know, it might last you, you know, who knows how long it will last you depending on the size of your tank. Yeah. The ozone thing will last many years. I would say in a home environment, if you calculated the whole thing, the ROI on this is definitely a few years out. But in yeah. your case. Oh, yeah. In my case, it's like a week. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I could go through like a five gallon pail of carbon every week easily. The, the bigger the tank, yeah. the bigger the ROI uh, yeah. because the amount of carbon you would have to use. Mm -hmm. And with the ozone reactor, I don't have to buy more ozone. I just turn Honestly, it up a I bit. think the uh, tank size is more like if it's over 200 gallons, you should use ozone. If it's under, it's probably better just to do carbon just because the. Uh, if you're consistent about it. Yeah. Yeah. But also like on a smaller tank, the amount of risk that you're putting on there with ozone, like and having to figure out getting it dialed. Like, okay. Imagine it on like a 10 gallon tank. How would you do? Okay. I, I got to admit, I got to admit right now, <laughs> I've gone down these paths in the past, mm -hmm. right? Where I get really excited about something, <laughs> you know, like I have like three really good experiences with mm -hmm. it. And then you guys can't help but get energized by this because I uh, like we're energized by yeah. it. Okay, I don't know how this one's gonna pan out in the end. Yeah. But it's almost like X Files, man. I need a poster <laughs> behind me that I want to believe now because it's so. I've, the results have been so good. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to believe, and I just want to find out how to use it right. Yep. Uh, and I can't wait. I mean, there's zero chance that within a year. If, for those of you who don't know. We're doing some experiments on it. Uh, Brent's setting them up right now. We'll we'll have some more data on all this mm -hmm. coming soon. And by soon, I mean like six months, uh, but <laughs> sooner than the last 20 years. Uh, so we will learn. Uh, another thing that like this kind of goes into like, have you ever heard of people dosing uh, hydrogen peroxide mm -hmm. to solve dinos and diatoms and stuff? Mm -hmm. Okay, and a, yep. a variety of different things. Okay, so that's the last one here, which is, Consider the similarity of ozone to hydrogen peroxide. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, so uh, hydrogen peroxide is H2O2, right? You have that extra uh, oxygen molecule attached to water. Ozone is just oxygen with an extra uh, oxygen molecule, so it's O3. Uh, and that spare oxygen molecule is what's reactive to the organics. So it's pretty much the same thing. One's just the gas form and one's water. That's exactly it. Mm -hmm. So hydrogen peroxide, is water with an extra oxygen and uh, uh, ozone is oxygen with an extra mm -hmm. oxygen, essentially. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and so we're oxidizing the water or the gas. The mm -hmm. effect is very similar. Uh, and in fact, uh, one of the pre uh, fluconazole in the clown harem tank, because we fed the thing mm -hmm. so much, we ended up with bryopsis in there in like plague proportions, right? It was it was really, really bad at times <laughs> uh -huh. uh, early on. And then, you know what we would do? We would drain the tank, man, oh, all the way to the bottom. Peroxide. I'd buy that bottle uh, right from Walgreens. <laughs> it has a little hand pump on it mm -hmm. and we just spray it. And by the time you're done spraying it, which is like, you know, two minutes, mm -hmm. you fill the tank back up. And then by tomorrow, man, all the bryopsis was gone. That's right? crazy. The oxygen is just wipe it out. And now you're seeing that also mm -hmm. the power of oxidants. And this is why I'm getting really, you can even tell it in my voice, I'm getting excited. Is mm. because like we're seeing that same power in frag dips too. Yeah. Right? When I dip the, uh, the frag in the uh, hydrogen peroxide, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, man, all the funky algaes and stuff that were going to come in there are gone tomorrow and you would never enter any of that stuff to your tank. I bet you there's a whole lot of pests actually mm -hmm. on there that won't tolerate the hydrogen peroxide, but the coral does. And we actually did a bunch of corals. We did some euphilia, we did some acans, yeah. we did a, a whole bunch of different corals, and they all tolerated the uh, hydrogen peroxide dips. Another investigates that I'd like to do more depth on. I wonder how ozone, or how much ozone you would need to have the same effect on bryopsis. 
I had the same thing. It was like, yeah. what if in my quarantine system, like a, you have a medicated quarantine yeah, system for Yeah, you have like coral, an ozone tank. Fit, <laughs> what if I have an ozone tank uh -huh. designed for the, the coral to just live in there for the next couple of months? And then it will probably solve many of the little like larval pests that hap mm -hmm. hatch out of those eggs and stuff. Yeah. Like, so, I mean, I'm just making stuff up now, but like, <laughs> I, I mean, if you think about the acro eating flatworm or the little red bug or whatever, mm -hmm. and whatever it's like, you know, you know, reproductive form is, is probably pretty small and delicate, but it hatches from that egg, yeah. you know, and this is the exploration. This is where, you know, oxidants, you know, oxidants in hydrogen peroxide, oxidants in ozone, mm -hmm. you know, and all the different forms and uses could be frag plugs. It could be uh, water clarity. It could be bacterial issues in your fish. It could yeah. be dinos. It could be diatoms. How do we use oxidants to better set up our tanks for success? I'm sure there's also a really good uh, definite application for quarantine too. We'll bring that to you guys as well. <laughs> oh yes, uh, you saw that from uh, Humble Fish. Uh, Humble Fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead of using uh, that like super formalin. toxic formalin, mm -hmm. just using hydrogen peroxide, which you can find on the shelf. Yeah, I've been using it a lot recently, just because I was curious and I like to experiment with new things, and I like it a lot. And for everyday people, it's so much safer. In fact, when we were doing the 80-20 uh, method, mm -hmm. you know, we were talking a lot about should we mention this hydrogen peroxide as an alternative to the form formalin. Yeah. And ultimately, I was a naysayer because I'm like, hey, man, what we brought you on the show for is to share your experience. Yeah. And your experience is using the marine collector's protocol, which doesn't use peroxide. Yeah. But you left that intrigued about peroxide oh, and yeah. tested it. I mean, Got to. <laughs> yeah, the results so far have been really good. And so for me, if I was going to start to have this conversation, uh, I think we might do some experiments here. And actually, mm -hmm. Elliot's talking about sending me some purposely sick fish uh, through, like I'd ordered these from a place. Let's put them through the process here mm -hmm. and, and you know show what makes it through uh, the 80-20%. Yep. And maybe we update it to have uh, oxidants peroxide. and peroxide in there mm -hmm. instead of a much more toxic, harder to deal with formula. Yep. All right. Well, uh, if you enjoyed this one, there is more uh, on all kinds of fish and different topics uh, with Elliot and I. You can find it here in the playlist and uh, subscribe because we're doing this kind of stuff every week. We'll see you next week.